Um, well, I'd like to welcome uh, everybody here today for our first NRES semest uh, seminar rather of the semester. Uh, it's good to see uh, more than just the NRES capstone students here today. Uh, so the NRES seminar series is something we've been doing since about 2014. Uh, and today is the first such seminar here this semester. Uh, and we invite uh, four to six uh, researchers uh, from the K-State campus and other universities, if, if we have them at our disposal, um, to come in and give a talk about their research in the that broad umbrella of natural resources and environmental sciences. Uh, so this is our, our kickoff seminar this semester. And for those of the, you who might be interested in seeing what our schedule's like for the rest of the semester, I would encourage you to visit our NRES website. All those seminars and the dates are listed. Uh, the next one uh, will be uh, on September 27th, so that's not this Thursday, but next Thursday, and Dr. Nathan Nelson from the Department of Agronomy will speak, and the title of his talk is Water Quality Concerns and Solutions for Kansas. Okay. So it's my pleasure this morning, yes, it's still the morning, uh, this morning to, uh, to briefly introduce Dr. Ryan Sharp, who I just met before... Uh, class began, uh, unfortunately just met. Um, uh, Dr. Sharp's an assistant professor in park management and conservation in our Department of Horticulture and Natural Resources, and I know a lot of the students here probably know Dr. Sharp. Um, so my little bit of research about him, some of his research uh, interests include environmental stewardship, resource recreation management, parks and protected area management, um, and looking at the effectiveness of educational interpretive programs. And I saw on his website, he's also in charge of the Park Management and Conservation Lab. And he listed uh, what I thought were some real interesting research questions that he and I'm, and I'm assuming his students are, are looking at right now. And I thought I would share just a couple of those. Because I think it's a good tie into what we're going to hear uh, here in a moment. How does interpretation influence visitor and tourist experience? How do we effectively evaluate the long-term outcomes of ecotourism? And how do we accommodate the increasing use of parks and protected areas uh, worldwide, while at the same time providing for a high-quality visitor experience and conservation of natural resources? So with that very brief introduction, uh, let's all welcome uh, Dr. Sharp. Thank you for the introduction, and that's a, a good lesson. If you put something on your website, something somebody might read it. So be careful what you put on there. Um, so what I want to talk about today is, uh, as, as the introduction kind of alluded to, is park and protected area management broadly. Uh, more specifically today, what I want to talk about is, is ways to accomplish that. So basically methodological means of, of gathering data that will help managers primarily uh, run their particular park or protected area. And what I want to start with is just looking at some photos. So anytime that you go to a park or protected area, so a park or protected area could be, uh, could be Tuttle Creek, it could be Tallgrass National Prairie, which is a national park site in Kansas, it could be Cimarron National Grasslands, which is a forest service site in western Kansas. Those are all going to fall under the same purview, right? Or it could be Fort Larned, a historical site which is run by the National Park Service. When I say protected areas, that's going to fall, that all of those will, will be in that category. So inherently, if, you're, if, if visitors are going to go to these places, which we want them to do, there's going to be impacts. There's no way around that. The only way to prevent visitor impacts from occurring in a park or protected area is to not have visitors inside those areas. And again, we don't want that. So these are, I'm going to just kind of highlight some common impacts. So on a running trail, um, this is in a national battlefield site. Um, this is, you know, heavily rutted, but this was actually the site of a battlefield. So what are the implications for having a rutted running trail through the middle of a national battlefield? These, uh, these over here are from ORV use, off-road vehicle use. Uh, Off-road vehicle use is not uh, always the devil that people make it out to be, but uh, limited use certainly can lead to lasting impact. 
Um, it all depends on the condition or the amount of use. Some other use, uh, these pictures inherently don't look like there's perhaps any problems here, but this picture here, there's actually a sign right here that says, please do not go over this wall. Um, so they're obviously not listening to that. And then this right here, you know, the kids are having a great time. This is at Gettysburg National Battlefield. However, there is a sign down here that says, please do not climb on the cannons. So even if we do our best efforts to provide information to visitors on how to protect the resources, oftentimes those messages are, are ignored. Or they're just not seen because uh, what I like to say is people have vacation brain when they go to these places, right? They're not interested in reading, they're not interested in learning all the time. So they do things that they normally wouldn't do in everyday life. These are Karens. So Karens are trail markers that are used in areas that don't have a lot of uh, trees to use for trailblazes. And this is what they're supposed to look like. This is a uh, Bates Karen. This is at Acadia National Park in Maine. And this is what they often look like um, after a busy day at the park. So unfortunately, either people don't know what these are as trail markers. This top rock here actually points the direction of the trail. And they topple them out of ignorance, or they do it because I don't know why, right? Uh, so that's just another visitor use impact. These two pictures, the, this picture here is probably familiar to many people. That is Old Faithful and Yellowstone. And here we have a bunch of people congregated around Old, Old Faithful. Uh, this is actually a pretty light day at Old Faithful in this picture. It gets much busier than that. But there's issues of crowding. And that's perceived crowding and actual density number of people in a particular area. Both of those are factors in this, in this discussion. And then we have things like this, right? You've probably all seen this with, with people putting their names on trees or carving their names into benches. Um, humans really like to see their name on things. Uh, so uh, we're always going to have that. And an interesting, we won't get into it today, obviously, but an interesting thing here is if you go to... Um, there's a place in, I think it's in Wyoming, it's called Inscription Rock, I think it was on the Oregon Trail, and we see somebody's name from 1875 or 1855 or whatever, that's historic. But at the time, it was probably graffiti, right? So where do we draw the line, will this ever be historic, you know, <laughs> Polly loves Matt or whatever. And then we have wildlife. So wildlife, a lot of the reason that people go to parks and protected areas is to see wildlife. We want people to see wildlife, it's great, right? We want to build conservation ethic in people. And one way to do that is interacting with wildlife in, in natural settings. However, this is a large animal, right? And these folks are from here to the back of the wall in this room, so maybe 10 feet, 15 feet away from an animal that if it decides to, can make their day very bad. Um, and then here, this is again in Yellowstone, this is a ranger, this is a black bear. And we have things called animal jams, right? So bear jams, elk jams, whatever you want to call it, uh, where somebody sees an animal in a park or protected area and they stop in the middle of the road. It's, it's a natural thing. Um, I will admit that I've done it before myself, where I see something cool on the side of the road and I stop my car in the middle of the road and I get out of my car. Not, I, I don't, you know, you won't see me on YouTube videos fighting bison or anything like that, but um, it's, 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 it's a natural human behavior to want to see these things. So that's another thing that we have to, to, to think about. And then traffic. So how do people get to most of these places? They, they usually drive, right? There certainly are urban parks, there are community parks, but a lot of the bigger ones that people tend to want to visit, especially in the summer, they drive to. So we can go to a place like Grand Teton National Park here, and you can wait an hour just to get into the park. How does that impact your experience? Does your level of satisfaction go down? Um, this is just a, a parking lot. It doesn't really matter where it is. This is in Pinnacles in California. But parking lots, how many times have you driven around a parking lot and not been able to find a place to park? Right? How frustrating is that? You just want to get out and hike, or you want to get out and see something, or you want to be out in nature, and you're driving around in your car cursing because there's no place to park, right? So how do we deal with all those issues? And then I just, I like these two pictures just because they're fun. 
Um, you know, wildlife obviously is, is, you can consider this guy wildlife if you want to. But visitor behavior has direct relationship on how animals behave as well too, right? So if, if this garbage can is not appropriate for an area that has animals that want to get into garbage cans, what are the animals going to do? They're going to get into the garbage cans, right? And raccoons are pretty good at getting into things. Um, and this picture I particularly like because it's just an, an, an incredible um, juxtaposition of wilderness and crowding. So this is at Katmai National Park in Alaska, which is about 5 million acres, plus or minus. And this is a line of people waiting to get to a platform to see bears in the middle of Alaska wilderness that you can only get to by boat or plane. What? That's crazy. So even in the most remote portions of our country, we're seeing lines to see, in this case, bears, right? So people really want to get out and see. And just as a number to throw out there, about 10 years ago, the, for, uh, the visitation to national parks was 278 million people, about 10 years ago. Last year, it was 330 million. That's a pretty big jump. And that's only national parks. And visitation at, at state parks in general are increasing. Forests, national forests are increasing. So we're seeing a, a larger demand for people wanting to go to these places, which is great which is great, right? We, we, we want that. Because a lot of the literature will tell us that the more contact that people have with these natural areas, the more likely they are to develop stewardship-related behaviors. So how do, we, how do we deal with this? What do we do? So that's what we're going to talk about. So these are, this is a, a, a list, but certainly not an exhaustive list of, of things that can be done to try to understand visitor use in parks and protected areas. And we're going to talk about some of these. Um, a lot of the work that I do and a lot of the work that other people do is, is reliant upon surveys. Surveys have limitations, like every other research method, but it's certainly a way that we can try to understand how people feel about certain things in parks. We're going to talk quite a bit about cameras, counters, and GPS. These are certainly not new methods, but they are perhaps a little bit newer to the uh, recreation resource management world. Um, they've been around for, for quite a while, but the, we're starting to utilize them a, a bit more. And something we're going to talk a little bit too is, is social media. So obviously social media is, is very prevalent in everyday life. Um, and a lot of people go to places because of social media. So if I didn't know about a place and then my friend posts something about you know, this great place that they went and visited, they'll be like, oh, I didn't even know that existed. I probably want to go check that out too. So you can see how that might lead to increased visitation in certain places as well. So we're going to try to cover uh, as much of these as we can here in the next half hour or so. OK, so surveys. We're going to start with surveys. Survey methodology, uh, again, is, is, has its limitations, but it does give us an insight into to visitors' perceptions, attitudes, and at least reported behaviors. Um, one, of the, one of the primary limitations of survey research is that we are measuring reported behaviors, not actual behaviors. Uh, so somebody could say that they did something, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they did. Um, that's why you want to have a, a, a large, robust, representative sample to try to control for some of those variables. Um, these are just some of the locations. You know, on-site visit, on-site survey administration is mostly the, the work that I do because that way we know we're actually targeting the audience that we want to try to talk to. Um, we're not necessarily sending out, sending out random samples. It's not a household survey. Uh, we're, we want to know a specific question to a specific problem in a specific place. That's a lot of the work that, that I do. So a lot of the work that I do is, is based on normative theory. So normative theory, real simple, is there's, we, we make the, the assumption that people coming to a park are protected have a common set of desires to go there, right? And there's certain normative pressures or normative ideals that people will conform to in these places based on their experience use history, okay? So what this is telling us, this basic graph here, is that we provide a, a set of, of conditions and then they tell us how acceptable or unacceptable those conditions are and I'll, I'll get into more specific examples here. And then we can quantitatively identify a range of acceptable conditions, right? So this middle line here, anything that falls below this middle line, visitors will rate as unacceptable conditions. 
Now, here's, here's the thing with this. When I, one of the first things I said was, if we, when, when, when visitors come to a park or protected area, we have to be able to um, have a tolerance for at least some level of visitor use impacts, right? Because if we had no tolerance for visitor use impacts, we, we wouldn't let anybody in, right? So there has to be a minimally acceptable condition that we're willing to tolerate and manage to, knowing that that will also help to, to meet our desired conditions in that particular place. So to give you a, a more concrete example here, this, this is what it looks like at the end of the study, right? This is a, a standard, it's called a norm curve. And here, the couple things that you need to know about this, this graph here are, at the bottom, we have a series of photos that we show to people, and we show them to the people that are actually on site, so they have context. And this is zero people all the way up to 35 people. We determine the number of people based on real conditions. This is in, this is in Aruba. Uh, so I went to Aruba. I stood at this place for probably three or four hours. I observed the conditions, and I tried to represent those conditions the best I could in these photographs. So then we give these pictures to people, and we ask them to rate them on this scale of minus four to plus four. Say, OK, so how acceptable are these conditions? So what this graph here tells us is that for the most part, this yellow represents we're getting into the uh, unacceptable range, and the red is, is unacceptable. So most people are like, this may, we're not cool with having that many people in this area, right? But however, these photos here all represent a range of acceptable conditions. So now managers at this location can say, well, you know what? The threshold for this particular location is no more than 25 people at a time. And you can manage to that. That's a quantitative measure. You can set up cameras. You can go have somebody go count once a month to see how the conditions are. And if you're exceeding that threshold that visitors have, that means that some sort of management action needs to be instituted, whether that's limiting use or dispersing use or whatever the case may be. So this gives managers a, a quantitative measure to work towards. These bubbles are basically the standard deviation, more or less. It's called the potential for conflict index, but it's based on variance and standard deviation. And the larger the bubble, the more variance there is in the answer. So essentially, there, this one, for example, there's a lot of agreement that this condition right here is pretty good, right? However, the level of agreement about this condition, although it's unacceptable, is not, not very good, right? So there's actually a pretty wide dispersal of, of, of answers to that. So we can actually say that it's pretty close to this line anyway, but the standard deviation if I had to guess on that bubble, I don't know exactly, but it's probably on this scale, it's probably about two. So that's a pretty wide range of answers on a, on a, on a scale of plus four to minus four. But either way, this gives managers something that they can hang their hat on and it's justifiable and it provides scientific evidence of why you made a decision to limit use if that's what you want to do. We can also do a similar thing with trails. So. Uh, trail conditions, and, and I should preface this by saying that almost all the literature points to visitors not having any idea about uh, natural conditions, right? So if you, give somebody, if you gave somebody this series of pictures, which we did, they're not going to be real good at gauging those conditions. It's just not, you know, it's not in most visitors' skill set. But you could say, here's a trail. What do you think about that? 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 And then they would rate that on that same scale, right? So, you know, I, if you put it in the context of this, you're like, oh, that looks great. But some people might not have any problems with this, right? Like if my kids looked at that picture, they'd be like, oh, cool, puddle, right? Um, but in terms of trail maintenance, that puddle is a, is a big problem, right? Other things that we can do with these surveys, so that's looking at thresholds and indicators of quality. Other things you can do with the surveys is try to understand people's preference for certain things. So this one, for example, this is at Buffalo National River in Arkansas. They are thinking about, these are all possible management actions that the, the managers are considering, and we can get people to rank order those, and, and they can tell us which one of those they think is, is most preferable. And um, in terms, we can look at encounter rates, um, which is a little bit different than those graphs that we just looked at, but we can overlay, these are different locations within a park right here, and we can overlay people's encounter rates and their desirability for certain encounter rates um, on this graph to see if there's any commonalities or any trends that, that we might want to pull out in terms of management. 
I, I hesitate to, to even bring this up, but I will. Um, is a lot of the work, a lot of the survey work, so typically when you do a survey, at least in the past, somebody would walk up to you, they'd give you a clipboard and a pencil, and they'd say complete this survey, right? We're moving more towards using tablets instead of uh, tablets such as iPads, instead of paper surveys. There's, there's a couple reasons for that, but one of the primary reasons is people are familiar with the technology for the most part, and it eliminates human error when we put the, the, the data in after the fact. So if we had a thousand paper surveys, somebody has to input that data and that introduces human error into the process. So at least with this, that skips that step, so that's one more thing that we can kind of hang our hat on. However, I want to point this out that this is just one question. We compared a paper survey and a tablet survey, and this is on a five-point scale, five being, um, so we need to take better care of plants and animals, five being uh, strongly agree and one being strongly disagree. This is the mean for the paper survey. This is the mean for the tablet survey. And we had pretty good ends, right? So 172 and 129, yeah. so it wasn't just like five people. So what that tells us, or at least uh, leads us to probably explore this a little bit further, is maybe there's a difference between tablets and paper surveys. Um, so that certainly needs to be explored further. <clears throat> okay, so that's, a, that's all quantitative data that we can get from, from surveys. You can also do qualitative work. So qualitative is, is more in-depth. Uh, with quantitative, we want a lot of numbers. Uh, we want to try to have representative samples. With qualitative, we're looking at much smaller uh, number of people that we talk to, and we're trying to get more rich data um, out of those individuals that we're talking to. You can think of uh, focus groups as an example of, of something that you could use qualitative data or a way that you can utilize qualitative data. So we'd ask people questions, and these are the kind of outputs that you would get, right? So you develop themes. So if we talk to uh, 20 people and we ask them all the same question, we would go through their transcripts and we would see that there's themes within those, those 20 people that we talk to. We'd pull that out and then we'd be able to get some general information about what people think. So that's qualitative data. I won't talk a lot about that. Okay, some, some, some more objective measures. So the surveys and the qualitative interviews are more subjective data, right? It's people's thoughts, their perceptions, their ideas. These human behavior cameras help us to, to, to capture more quantitative data, right? Less, more objective, I'm sorry, more objective data. So it's not reliant upon the visitor telling us what's going on. So what we can do is we can take these cameras, and these, these are all hidden in this area here, but there's three cameras here, and basically they're pointed at a visitor attraction, and we can see what visitors are doing. We can, we can observe their behavior, but in most, count, most times we're trying to, we saw those, uh, uh, the norm curve earlier. So we can look at the pictures that we're taking with these cameras, compare it to the norm curve, and see if people are even perceiving the number of people uh, correctly, right? So we can take the subjective and the objective data and, and, and compare the two to get a more robust sample and better understanding of what's happening at these places. So this is an example of a camera placement and what we're doing. This is at Buffalo National River. We put a camera here. Nobody can probably see it because it's not big enough, but it's right there. And we put that camera across the river because we were interested in seeing this. So this picture doesn't convey it necessarily, but this is a very popular put-in at this river. And the managers here were concerned that this place was overrun with visitors um, during the summer especially. So basically, this camera takes a picture every 15 minutes, and it gives us a general overview. We, don't, we, we only check these cameras about once every three or four months. So if we put it at any more than 15 minutes, the camera would die within the first week or two, right? Um, and these things take about 12 batteries each. So we can get this data, and then what we can do with that data is we can, and we also, so this right here, this is our objective data, but we also had a survey that went along with this and here's the survey results, okay, saying the, the uh, range of acceptable conditions, these are the number of people, right, in, in, in their viewscape. And then what we can do is we can take the camera data and we can place what people said, which is about 23 people is our threshold, and we can place that on the camera data right here, and we can see that you know what, we exceeded the threshold, but only a couple times, right? 
So maybe this place isn't nearly as overrun as, as the managers thought it was. Right? I think humans have a tendency to see the worst set of conditions and then that's their baseline. Right? But what this does is this says, yeah, okay, you have a couple days where things get pretty crazy. Um, and if we look at the dates, we can see that they don't really show us a whole lot of trends for this, but a lot of times they correspond to holidays, which makes sense. So we just, this, this gives a ground truth thing to the managers to say, okay, yes, it gets very busy, but it probably isn't as bad as you think it is. Certain places it actually is, but in, in a lot of cases it, it is not. We can also use GPS to track visitors. So when I say track visitors, I'm not saying we're collecting all their personal information or anything like that. We use these little GPS trackers, which is in the hand here. Um, and it's, a, it's actually a data logger. It's not necessarily a tracker. So what it does is it pings a satellite every 10 seconds and collects the data for wherever that tracker is. But it doesn't collect real-time data. So if somebody collecting or using that, that GPS tracker gets lost in the woods, I can't find them. Um, I know where they were once I found the tracker, but I wouldn't be able to find them in real time. It just collects data points from the satellites. But what those data points allow us to do is to see how visitors move in space and time. So this is at Fort Larned uh, National Historic Site in Kansas. And basically all of these little spaghetti lines, these are all tracks. This, this, is a, this is basically 100 tracks put on top of each other. And you can't see the direction of travel, but what we found out is because we collect uh, spatial and temporal data, is that we found out that people walked in right here, and then they walked over here, and then they walked here, and then many people quit here and went home, and not only half the number of people went here as they went here. So that's valuable information. It's like, okay, why aren't people going to the other side? Uh, because there's some really cool stuff over there. Uh, but for whatever reason, people were not going over to the other side. So it allows us to do that. And also, it gives us time data, right? The time data is also important because then we can understand distribution of use over time. So this is at Cumberland Island National Seashore in Georgia. And basically what this is telling you is you see the timestamps. This shows this use over time. So at 10 o'clock, this is where the, the, the darker the color, the more concentrated use. So as you can see, people move. This is a, a, a great example because almost every single person comes in here, goes to the beach, walks up the beach, and goes back here. The only way to get to this island is a ferry. They get off at the ferry here, they get on at the ferry here. So it's a good representation of, of, of use. But it shows you at what times people are, are moving about the island, right? So we can tell managers maybe where to place rangers, um, maybe where to have interpretive talks at certain times, right? So these heat maps are valuable for, for giving managers input into to how to manage their, their parks. And then trail counters. Trail counters are valuable as another tool. Trail counters on their own aren't, aren't all that valuable because uh, they, they need to be calibrated quite often and they only give one data point. So it need, we usually pair them with cameras and surveys to give us a fuller pic, a picture. But this is, uh, this is at the Bright Angel Trail in Grand Canyon. So we, we go out there and we find a place to, hit, to hide one of our trail counters, which is right in here. And it's basically just an infrared beam that shoots across the trail. Every time somebody walks across the beam, it trips the, the counter. And then we get a uh, um, account of, of, of what people are doing and when they, when, when they went through that light. And then it generates data like this. So Grand Canyon shows us some, some decent spikes which correlate with some major events. So if you look at this monthly total down here, so every time somebody walks by, it generates a point and then it creates these graphs. In May, you can see we have a big spike, and this is at a one counter. Uh, there's like eight or nine counters that we have out. But there's a spike in May, and there's a spike in October. In May, there's the North Rim and the South Rim of the Grand Canyon. The North Rim of the South Can or Grand Canyon opens in May, and it closes in October. So that's when there's a rush of people to do those activities. They want to get out as soon as possible, and then they want to get out before it closes. But that allows us to identify those trends, and only crazy people go to the Grand Canyon in July. So at least hiking. But this it gives you all of these numbers, and they need to be calibrated. If you just put a trail counter out tomorrow, and then you got a bunch of data back, you, you won't be able to tell what it means, right? You have to calibrate it. You have to know how many people, you have to sit there 
and count how many people go through and make sure that the counter is actually counting those people. And here, we have the added uh, uh, elements of, of mule traffic. So how do you account for four legs going through at a time, right? So we have to calibrate those counters on a regular basis. And then we can do trail surveys, right? So this is a um, very quantitative method where we have a trail here and we measure for all of these different things. And again, a lot of these things are related to monitoring over time. If we collect one of these data points and then we never do anything with it again, it's, it's worthless, right? So if we collect this, this trail here, which is a pretty well-worn trail, uh, it's not too wide, but it does have a decent le level of incision, which is depth. But basically, we can set up a transect and we can understand the depth, the rugosity, which is basically the rockiness. Um, we can look at the visual and see if the trail is braiding, if it's moving, uh, the muddiness. And then if we go back in, in a couple months or a year or whatever the protocol may be, we can see if there's been any change to that trail and if we need to enact certain management actions that may uh, help preserve that, that trail over time. So this is a very time intensive uh, procedure. So if this trail is a mile long, depending on how many, like if it's a, a mile long, we'd probably do every tenth of a mile we'd do a measurement. If the trail is 20 miles long, we'd probably do maybe every mile. Or if, more sec if certain sections are more intensely used, we might uh, focus on those intensely used areas. And I think this is the last method I'm going to talk about. This is a, a, a climbing site. This is in the Red River Gorge in the Daniel Boone National Forest in Kentucky. This is the base, this is, a, this is somebody standing at a rock here, and this is the base of a climb. So climbers will set up down here, and as you can see, there's a pretty clear demarcation of the impact area, right? So anytime you have people setting up a climb or you have a campsite or whatever, you're gonna have an impacted area. So what this method does is it basically looks at the visual boundaries of that area, and then you set up a, a, a transect to, to see the, the, the length and the width and the volume, essentially, of that uh, impacted area, and then you can compare that over time, and that's what this study looked at. It looked at um, 2007 and 2013. And one of the take-homes from this study was the way impacts work is it's, it's a curvilinear relationship. So if you have a pristine campsite, essentially you're going to see the vast majority of your impacts in the, in the first couple uses, right? So your line's going to go up really quick. If impacts are here, right, you're going to see your impacts go up very quickly. However, however, over time, that line evens out. Because as you can see here, you can't really get any more impacted than this. There's root exposure, it's, it's dirt. You're not, you're not going to have any more impacts, pretty much, unless somebody goes in there with a backhoe. So those initial impacts are really important to monitor because once it's impacted, that's the way it's going to be for quite a while unless you go in there and actually do something managerial, either closing it or rehabbing it, whatever the case may be. Okay, then social media. So I'll talk real quick about this. Social media is, is a way to find out where people are going, right? So we can harvest, one of my graduate students is working on harvesting Twitter data at Katmai National Park in Alaska. So what she's basically trying to find out is, can we use social media data, in this, in this instance, Twitter data, to understand visitor use patterns, right? Because what do people do when they go places? They take pictures, sometimes they're geotagged, and then they upload them to social media. So if we can understand how people are moving, what they're taking pictures of, where they're going, where concentrated use is, perhaps social media is a way to do that, and it's, we can do that from here. We don't ever have to go to Alaska to do that, right? Going to Alaska to, ca to collect surveys, very expensive, right? Collecting Twitter data, it's free. I don't know if it's gonna work yet. She's working on her research right now, but that's kind of what we're thinking. And you can also purchase phone data too. So we all have phones and we all have GPS on our phones, most of us. I do know somebody with a flip phone still, but most of us have GPS on our phones and you can opt out of it, but most of us don't, right? So it's constantly tracking you and where you're going. So you can purchase that data from one of these companies and then you can understand visitor use patterns that way because everybody's gonna have their phone on them. So that's something we're gonna actually start doing at Joshua Tree um, in California coming this spring. We're gonna start testing that to see what we can figure out. 
and I do believe this is the last one, is um, anybody ever been to explore.org before? Anybody ever heard of it? Okay. You should make a note of it because it will waste your entire day looking at bears or cheetahs or uh, dolphins or whatever the case may be. Basically, they have webcams all over the world. So this webcam right here is at Katmai National Park, and it's focused on the bears. So you can go there and get a live feed. Right now, if we went to that website, there'd be a camera, and we'd, we'd see some bears hanging out. Um, so what we did is we did a study basically asking people to complete a survey of their viewing experience online. And we compared it to visitors that actually went to the park to see if there's any difference in their, their pro-conservation related behaviors, reported behaviors. What we found, and this is a preliminary study, and I'm happy to talk about this later, but what we found is that there really isn't much of a difference. So the implication here is, if we're really trying to protect that bear in that environment, it's perhaps better that we don't send a lot of people up there and disturb that bear in that environment. And if we can generate pro-environmental -envir pro behaviors from viewing a webcam, is that something we should be looking into, right? Um, these people developed very intense relationship with these bears online. There's chat rooms, there's ranger chats. They name the bears, they know where the bears are. Bear 33321, otherwise known as Otis, uh, is eating right now. If you go to camera three, you can check them out, right? Um, I gave a presentation in one of the chat rooms last year. I mean, it's, it's a community. And community is, is one of the things that we look at when we talk about conservation and pro-conservation behaviors, building a community. So this could be, a, it's an interesting line of work at the very least. And uh, don't let this picture alarm you, but when you're out doing data collection, you never know what you're gonna find. This is plastic, it's not a real skull uh, or skeleton, but this is a plastic skeleton I found three miles <coughs> into Big Cypress National Preserve. No idea why it was there or how it got there. Uh, but I thought I'd take a picture of it because it's interesting. <laughs> so, and that's, what, that's, that's all I got. We got 12 minutes for questions, yeah? Sure. If yeah. people have questions, I encourage questions. Yes, sir. Uh, what about these uh, new glasses that they put on? Have they looked into anything like that where you can... Virtual reality? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, I've never used one, but I have seen them. It seems like that's kind of the, the trick anymore. Would that be something worth looking into? I, I think it would be. I think it would be worth looking into. I don't know of any research related to that. Perhaps somebody has done it, but it's it's one of those. I think it's related to the webcams. Is that if if our ultimate goal is to build um, pro environmental behaviors mm -hmm. in people, does it really matter how we do it? Like if we do it wearing virtual reality glasses or we do it looking at a webcam, if the ultimate result of that is that somebody donates to the Wildlife Society or somebody um, you know, uh, changes their behavior, they, they stop buying palm oil because it's destroying orangutan uh, habitat in, in Borneo, right? So it's how do, how, do we, how do we cultivate those behaviors that we desire? So I, I, all those things are, are relevant lines of inquiry. Yes, ma'am. Are you going to let me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, I sit on a Federal Transportation Research Board. And when you really look at data when it comes to areas like we just were at the Bonneville Dam, you want visitors to come. But the goal is you don't want them to get in and out because you have concessionaires that people need to stay longer. And the problem with the Bonneville Dam is people would go from several hours to now it's 20 minutes go look at it real quick and then go back to their cars and leave and that's not our goal you want them to go and enjoy the, the experience and so now with this data we can try to find out one can we where can we put people where can we park them are they actually staying a short period of time or longer time so this data is so useful mm. in so many aspects but it's for financial it's for your concessionaires it's for your traffic that comes in how it uses the resource, how it impacts the resource. So it's good information. Thank you. And, and I think over, over time, um, use has, especially in more natural parks like a Yellowstone or something like that, 
use has transitioned from overnight use to day use. So we've, we've seen that, that trend for the last 30 years where you know, uh, the people used to pack up the, the Griswold family truckster and go out for five or six days. Now people are, are more interested in, I, I don't, I shouldn't say I know this. My, my guess is people are more interested in conveying their experience to other people as opposed to actually having it. That's something I'm looking into is, is because that 20 minute piece is important because you can't develop pro, pro environmental behaviors by spending 20 minutes at a place. It's just impossible, right? So are people more interested in taking a selfie of themselves and then posting it online as opposed to learning more about that area and the conservation issues that might be going on there or the wildlife or, or what can I do here? I mean, what my, my, my thought process is I think people are more interested in likes than they are actually going to these places. I don't know that yet. I'm, I want to investigate that. But we have definitely seen the trend of people spending less time in parks and protected areas. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I was doing some research this summer and looking at various mountains, like just on Google Earth, and they've synced a lot of like the 360 pictures. You can actually zoom in on Google Earth and you have these like pinpoints of 360 pictures that then are connected to a website. So um, it seems like there's a lot of this like out there, but how do we create like a comprehensive kind of assessment of it? Like if people are just voluntarily putting stuff in, how can we see it from like a holistic perspective and use what we already have? So, let, me, let me see if I understand your question. So people are... Uh, putting photos into a database and posting them places, mm -hmm. and how can we utilize that data? Yeah, basically, like, it's, there's a lot of unregulated ways that people are, are tracking them, their visitation, and so is there a way to, like, utilize what is already in the web? More like a data query. Of do, you, do you know what Strava is? No. So Strava is a, anybody know what Strava is? So Strava is a, uh, like it's on my watch, right? It's a GPS, like a running app or a hiking app. And that data, you can get that data, right? So a lot of people will go on a hike and then they'll post their, their data, their, their Strava hike or whatever. And there's a ton of apps that do this kind of stuff. But is that kind of what you're saying? Is that kind of this data that's out there that we're not utilizing? Yeah. I, it, it's really just a matter of somebody sitting down and doing it. I know people, um, I don't know if a lot of people use Flickr, but people know what Flickr is perhaps. Um, it's not as utilized as it used to be, but there's a lot of work right now, uh, or at least the last three or four years, of people using Flickr photo data, photo data to understand visitor use patterns in places like um, uh, Tanzania and Kenya and some of these wildlife parks because those photos are, are, are geotagged, and then we can understand when people were places. We can also see if some of those outfitters are taking people places they're not supposed to. Um, so that data is out there. It's just a matter of somebody sitting down and, and aggregating it and using it for intentional purposes. I don't feel like I'm answering your question. It's basically just like, can, like in your research, can you utilize stuff that's already out there as opposed to like proposing completely new? Like, like, uh, okay, so like a meta-analysis or something like that. Yeah. Yes, we can certainly do that. I don't do that, but, but there are studies out there that compile past data. One of the issues, one of the major um, criticisms of some of the work that, that I do and other researchers like me is that we're very place-based and it's difficult to compare studies across different places. Um, you know, if you have a, a, a set of five national studies, you could probably, as long as the questions are relatively similar and the data points are relatively similar that you're trying to collect, you could do a meta-analysis on that. But it's hard for me to take data from Buffalo National River and compare it to data in Theodore National Roosevelt Theodore Roosevelt National Park in North Dakota when I'm asking completely different questions based on the manager's uh, issues at that place. So it can be done, but it's a little bit more difficult because of the place-based nature of much of the research. Did that answer the question? Okay, sorry, I got there, it just took a while. What else? Yes, sir. I was actually gonna ask that question about, um, I mean, the data is really, really interesting, but it is tied to a single location and the ability, possibility of, of generalizing some parts of that data that might be useful across 
different types of protected areas in different parts of the, of the country. I, I think you, you, you talked about that. Well, there, there, are, there certainly are generalizable parts of it, right? So a lot of, a, a lot of the surveys that we do, surveys, for example, the, the first section of our survey is visitor use history. So we can take that visitor use history, and it doesn't really matter where we are, and we can kind of use that to compare you know, different types of users at different places. So we can certainly uh, aggregate some of that data to, to make some generalizations. When we get into, uh, for example, Buffalo River, if I'm monitoring use on a river, it's hard for me to compare that use in, in, a, in a terrestrial park, right? So there certainly are pieces of it. Um, the, the one picture I showed you of Fort Larned, I'm actually writing a paper now where I'm trying to say, hey, this is, this method is, the methods are more generalizable than the actual data, which, which makes sense. But the, the, the GPS data that you can collect at Fort Larned, you, you could do that at, at Fort Scott. You could do that at Gettysburg. You could do that just about anywhere and, and understand the temporal and spatial distribution of your visitors to help interpretive programs. Um, so the data is a little bit more difficult because of the specific nature, yes. So a lot of the data that you presented uh, had lots of pulses of use. So do managers manage for the pulses, or do they manage for the average? That's, that's the million dollar question. Um, so one of the textbooks I have my students read, uh, one of the first chapters is, there is no such thing as the average visitor, um, according to Bob Manning. And uh, that's the, the, the danger of managing to the average is that a lot of parks have very different constituents and stakeholders, right? If, if I go down to Tuttle Creek, I'm going to have boaters, I'm going to have campers, uh, I'm going to have people just out for the day, I'm going to have people doing archery. If you averaged all of those people's thoughts, you could come up with a mean, but it's, 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 that mean isn't going to mean a whole, lot, a whole lot, right? So I think what managers end up doing is they end up managing for those, those pulses because they see that I think what I said earlier is I think a lot of times managers tend to see the worst conditions and use those as their baseline. So I think that's what a lot of them are managing to. Um, and frankly, it, it comes, there's, there's a question I didn't actually pose earlier, is that there's two, there's two main things that all managers, especially for protected areas, need to consider, right? Um, are we protecting the resource, whatever that is, and are we providing experiences for, for visitors? Those are the two main things that most, there's a lot more to it, right? I'm simplifying it, but those are the two main things that most people that are managing a park or protected area have to consider. And those two things don't always line up, right? They're actually in conflict. How do you provide opportunities for visitors to do what they want while still preserving and conserving an area? Oftentimes that doesn't work. So that's the ultimate tension in this research is that you want to provide visitors with opportunities to do things, but how do you set those minimally ex uh, acceptable standards that still preserve the resource while allowing visitors to pursue the activities that they want to? That's, that's the ultimate question. And I, if, if somebody in this room can answer that, then you can have my job, right? Um, it's, it's, it's very difficult to answer. I got one minute. I'll say one more thing. Yeah. And your finances go to those polls. So you, you seem to, or at least we do, we put our money to where those high use Areas are. Yep. Which which could lead to other places not getting the resources they need, right? That's right. Sure. But trying to identify those pulses can can perhaps I you know open managers' eyes a little bit and say, okay, yeah, we do have an issue, but it's not nearly as often as we think it is. Right. So I nice. perhaps a better way to allocate resources. Do right, time for one more question, if you All right, I'd ask everybody to join me in thanking Ryan for a really yeah. interesting time. Thank you.